And Dave was one of the, uh, the human factors uh, designers on Star. Thanks, Bob. This is on. Um, okay, so what do we what do we have up here? Let me just. I'm about to operate this stuff. I'm going to give you about a 30 minute demo of, of Star from a user perspective. Here we have a couple of the uh, first version stars, the 8010. They were so big that they didn't let's see, this is so typical. Everybody just leaves junk all over everything here. <laughs> oh yeah. There's two because uh, there's a definite non-zero probability one of them will break in the next 30 minutes and we'll switch over to the other. Down here is the version two of the hardware, the so-called um, 6085. It's about half the volume, even less, of um, the first version. It came out about five years later. And down here, we have the um, version 17 of the STAR uh, <laughs> system, which is a little smaller even. So here we have the STAR with the skins off, so uh, after Bob's tour of it, you can probably identify a lot of the pieces inside there. So I'm going to give you a demo. I'm going to pretend I'm a new user and I'm going to set up a working environment and I'm going to do a multimedia document. And I've done this a lot of times and like the talk says, this is my last time. <laughs> I've got to get out of this business. So. Um, and in fact, it's hard to give a talk on STAR because more and more when I do, people say, what's the big deal? Everybody does that. So, what? No, the screen's not supposed to be up there yet. Okay, that's a little um, bouncing uh, square uh, screensaver. Um, let's see. So one thing I want to want to re reiterate from a user's perspective is thinking back to those days of the mid-70s, all the screens, all the terminals that people used in those days were text-oriented and they all used command line interfaces. So our challenge as a um, designer was to try to bring the computer into the office professional world instead of trying to get the professional to become a computer user. These guys were all pretty computer phobic and most had never used a computer before. So I'm going to talk about, uh, I hope pretty forthrightly, uh, Star's strengths and weaknesses. Uh, some of its strengths still aren't in products 20 years later, and some of its weaknesses are pretty legendary. So a strength is this was a breakthrough product, which made a huge improvement in computer usability by non-computer professionals. Today, it's in use. The, the basic interface ideas are in use by over 100 million people worldwide. Uh, it was the first, had the first visual point and click interface. It was the first object oriented interface. It was the first use of icons. It was the first interface to identify and follow what has since become standard human computer interface principles. It was uh, it used the first commercial Ethernet. It used the first commercial laser print server. But uh, another way to put a spin on that is a weakness was it tried to do too much all by itself. It tried to do too many new things, and it did some well and some poorly, and really all of them had to be done well for the thing to be a success. Um, from my point of view, I'd like to point out another weakness that I think was the biggest mistake we made, and that was to make it a closed system. As Dave Liddell pointed out, there was no independent software industry at the time, so it made more sense in context, but in retrospect, that was the biggest mistake we made. For example, the Macintosh toolbox was um, a huge improvement over Star. Uh, another weakness of it was even with all of the impressive performance that was built into this little machine, it was still drastically underpowered. And Star would run quite well on today's machines, thank you very much. But um, it was the software was about 10 years ahead of its time uh, for this hardware. Basically, the machine was about the power of a Mac Plus, I believe. Is that 
A uh, couple things I want to point out. We use the two button mouse here. Okay, why two buttons? Because user testing showed that one was too few and three were unnecessary. <laughs> the Mac has two buttons too, for that matter. Uh, it's only the, the second one is on the keyboard. And the PC has. The PC has three or four or five or as many as you want, uh, and that, you know, I don't want to say anything about that. <laughs> now, the keyboard was pretty innovative, and if I was to point out the biggest reason for STARS user interface success, it's this keyboard. In particular, in addition to the standard typing array, we have three banks of function keys that were hard labeled with their meanings. The most important were these on the left side. Uh, in fact, the bigger ones were the most important of those. Delete, copy, move, and show properties. Those four generic functions were, were based on observations of what fundamental principles were in, um, in computers, you know, in, in a programming language, those are the operations you do. You copy data structures, you delete data structures, and you move data structures. So we elevated those to the level of the user interface. Across the top, we had some that dealt with text, like bold, italics, underline, and down here we had some others. So the effect was you could actually operate STAR for quite a while by putting your left hand on these keys and your right hand on the mouse. And if you were left-handed, we apologize. <laughs> um, and operate STAR that way. It was two-handed operation. Uh, I was sort of modeled after what Engelbart was doing in, uh, at SRI at the time, when he was using this little strange little keypad that user testing showed that mere mortals couldn't, couldn't learn. <laughs> but they could do this. Okay. So now I'm going to, one of the points I'd like to make here from a user interface perspective is that this interface has still not been surpassed in, in many ways today. And one of the ways it has not been surpassed is in the very few commands that you need to do complicated things in STAR. I'm going to create a multimedia document using fewer than a dozen commands. In fact, the entire demo is going to use fewer than a dozen commands. All right, what else? Oh, there's another um, principle. Uh, we really like this idea of Seymour Papert's about powerful ideas. Powerful idea is something of great generality that if you apply pervasively can make a system both more powerful and simpler at the same time. And as a human interface developer, um, that's a very important pair of criteria. So one of, the, one of the powerful ideas that we adopted was the notion of copying. Copying is a paradigm for operating the system, and you'll see that in the demo. We make copying pervasive in STAR. Copying is easier for people to do than creating by scratch. You know, uh, that's why people, like my son here, um, who take tests, love the multiple choice tests, because all you have to do is you know, figure out the most likely answer, rather than the fill in the blank tests, which require you to generate something from scratch. By the way, that's exactly why the reason people don't like command line interfaces is because you're faced with a blank screen and you have to generate a command line with all the switches and everything from your own memory. Okay, so let's do a demo. Okay, the first thing we're gonna do is log in to the system. Star was networked from day one. Uh, Pardon? What is not on the screen? Oh, the wiggle. Yes, um, yeah, we apologize for all the shaking. Uh, if you were to come look at the star screen afterwards and you're all invited to, it's really rock solid. It has to do with the mismatch of the scan rates. This is an interlaced screen and the camera just can't get a sync rate that will stabilize it. So the screen I'm looking at is not wiggling like the one you are. We apologize for that. but. So come up afterwards. Okay, so I have to log in to, to even um, do anything with STAR, but 
I only have to log in once. I've now identified myself to the system, and every server I go to or any other host anywhere on the network, I no, no longer have to log in. It will negotiate for me. Now look at the top of the screen here. <laughs> See that white thing up there? That is not a menu bar. Let me repeat that. That is not a menu bar. This is an area for messages and prompts and things. Way over here on the edge is a pull-down menu, sure enough, but those are infrequently used commands that we didn't have time to get rid of. <laughs> Down here in the lower right corner, <laughs> good man, I have a monitor here too. This is not part of the Star hardware, by the way, this little Sony monitor here. This is our um, handle onto the whole world of the network. It's uh, what we call a directory icon, and I'll open it. And it opens up into a window. And here are all the categories of things that are available to me as a new user. I remember this was my first use of Star. And um, so I'm going to say, well, let's see now. I want to get a working environment together that will let me do some real work. OK, basic documents. All right, that sounds promising. So I'll open that up and see what's in there. I'm doing that by um, double clicking on it. Or there is an open key on the keyboard that will let me single click and then push open. OK, now here's where I'm actually going to use this, um, these, these generic commands. I'm going to select this thing and say copy. And then I'm going to move my cursor over here to the right and deposit it. So that was the use of the copy key. That got me one of these things out onto my desktop. Uh, now we're going to go back over here and copy some others in. Pardon? We did call it that, yes. And in fact, it was very deliberately called a desktop, and the icons chosen were very deliberately chosen to be familiar to the office professionals. So the way we chose them is we looked around the office and said, well, let's see, there's some folders and some documents and file cabinets and, uh, well, maybe not printers, but uh, uh, there's a bookshelf and a wastebasket and so forth and so on. And so those are the icons that we built into Star, trying to get the computer into the user's world. OK, so I'll copy out a folder. What else am I going to copy out? Here's something, a records file. This was our um, equivalent of a database. And so I might, might want to use that. Uh, here's a spreadsheet, so I'll copy that out. What the heck? All right. That's all of these things. So let's go back and look at our categories again. Hmm. OK, filing. Well, let's see what's in there. A bunch of file servers. And you can see we've named them like uh, universities. OK, I don't, I don't want to do that. I'm just going to go on. OK, mailing. That sounds promising. I'm going to want to do some mail. All right, so let's see what we got here. OK, an outbasket. That's, that sounds promising. So I'll copy. Hello, there we go. I'll copy the um, outbasket and in basket. I'm, I'm selecting these things, and in every case, just saying copy. So far, I've used. Dragging. Pardon? You're not dragging. It's not a click and drag. No. It's a noun, verb, destination. You got mail, Oh, I got mail. <laughs> Gee. From 1980. Uh, uh, I hope. Uh, I hope the issue hasn't expired here. I, I, I better read that. I, I'll read a little bit later here. OK, well, let's see. We're going to want to do some printing, so I'll get a couple more things out. I think by now you're getting the idea. Uh, this is a browsing interface to the network. Basically, this use of the directory icon allowed us to bring STARS interface ideas to the world of the network. Uh, it wasn't until um, Anderson did uh, what was it? Mosaic? What was the predecessor of Netscape? Mosaic, yeah. Until he did that, that we had a similar interface to the network. Okay. 
Uh, okay, this is probably enough of that stuff for now. So I'm just going to close my little directory. So now let's take a look at this, this whole screen here. So this is what I've, I've set up. I've set up some documents, some uh, folders, a uh, database, spreadsheet, mail, printing, ready to do some work. So let's go to the blank document. And now here's where copying becomes pervasive. The way you work is you make a copy of an existing document. And then you edit the copy. Uh, so therefore, every document becomes like a form pad, a source for new documents. There's no, no special concepts needed. So I'll open this. Oh, let's see. Before I do that, now I'm going to show you um, an, another key I haven't used yet, the Show Properties key. I said that STAR was an object-oriented interface. These little pictures are not just pictures. They are objects that have semantics. They have both state and behavior, like any object and object-oriented programming. Uh, and when you say show properties, it will show you the state. So um, this one has things like a name and a couple of uh, information-only properties. So I'll call this the history demo. All right. So now my little blank document becomes a history demo. So now I'll double click on it and open it up. And sure enough, it's blank, just like the source that you. Now let's go up and look at the top of the window again. OK, there's three commands here. This question mark is for context instead of help. This closes the window. And this causes a paginate or layout, page layout to happen. Way over here on the right, is uh, a pull down menu of commands to deal with tables. And even further is another little pull down menu of infrequently used commands that we didn't really want you to pay any attention to. Let's go up and look at this top thing. This is still not a menu bar. <laughs> this is it. These are the commands necessary to, to construct a star document. Okay, so let's just start doing some stuff here. Okay, this is very tiny, so that's uh, the first thing we should do is make it larger. Now, I'm going to um, select it and hit the Show Properties key, because like anything, text characters are objects. So they have attributes. Uh, they have both paragraph and, and uh, font attributes. So these are the paragraph ones. I can make it center, saying double width, um, double height. Let's go look at the character properties. Uh, okay, let's make it the classic font, which is serif, 24 point size and bold. Okay, so when I say done now, that thing I selected turns into the properties. Very nice audience here. Uh -huh. <laughs> you all invited to the to the next uh, uh, last uh, talk. <laughs> Actually, there's the penultimate last talk, and uh, last and in April we gave the ultimate last talk. So this must be the post ultimate last talk. <laughs> okay, so now we'll type some more stuff. Um, Um, okay, well, let me see. Now, this is a little too big, so I'm just going to select this whole paragraph. Now, I could bring up the property sheet, but that's what the top row of function keys let me do as their accelerators for having to go to the property sheet and click those properties. Uh, oh, okay, here's the top row of function keys. They've sh Never mind. <laughs> so I can do things like I can make it centered or not centered, and I can make it larger or smaller just by pushing some of those keys. And so common operations could be done using those top row function keys. And I'll show you, in fact, that those are virtual keys that are remapped from as the context changes. OK, so now I'm going to show you a new thing here, a new, key, a new function called the uh, keyboard, the virtual keyboard. So I'm going to push the keyboard key. And when I do, you'll see that at the top of the window here, 
That top row of function keys, of which there are eight, get remapped to these meanings. So I'm going to show you the key by pushing the show key, and down at the bottom of the screen, the virtual keyboard shows up. And so I can say, okay, let's just see some office symbols for math, for logic symbols, Greek letters, what else? Italian, uh, Spanish, Russian, or maybe the Dvorak key keyboard layout if you'd like to set it to that and type with that one. But what I want to do now is I want to go to the special keyboard set, and these are smart characters or smart objects. Uh, and one of the ones I'd like to do now is insert a graphics frame. So I'm going to uh, hit the A key, which says a graphics frame. And back up here in our document, a little frame will appear. Yes, you could click on it by just moving the mouse to it. The question is, could you click on those virtual keys with a, with a mouse? And the answer is yes. Let's see, before I do this, I'm going to move this uh, keyboard window off to the right side of the screen. Okay, that's properties as well. Yeah, so it, it also has some properties. And then I'm going to uh, center this thing again. Okay. Now, when I select the frame, this graphics frame, you'll see that um, the top row of keys automatically got remapped to graphics type things like stretch and magnify. So I'm going to push the stretch key. And now I can uh, adjust the size of this thing. OK, great. What I want here is a bar chart. So I'm going to go to the second document that I copied out earlier, this basic graphics transfer sheet. This is modeled after the rub off sheets that existed in the day. These were little sheets, transparent sheets with graphical symbols on them. And you would put them on top of a typewritten page and scrub on the back of it with an eraser, and it would transfer the symbol onto the page. Well, we did the same thing only electronically. We have little um, electronic transfers here. So we have some simple ones like lines and rectangles and ovals. So I'm going to select this one and say copy. And using that same command that I've been using all along, the copy command, I can get a copy of it, and I can stretch it since it's a graphical thing. And so I'll stretch it out a little bit here. All right. Let's see. Let me uh, move this thing so that I get it where I want it. I got this kind of a sticky mouse, so it's hard for me to do this. All right, that's, that's basically good enough. So that's a very simple little graphic transfer. Here's one that maybe is more interesting down here is a bar chart. This is a complex object, but I deal with it in exactly the same way. I select it, I say copy, and I click where I want the copy to go. And I can stretch it using the stretch command. So even though it's got a whole lot of semantics to it, the interface is the same. Let's see if I can actually get the flow. Why can't I get that? There we go. Uh, boy, my mouse is definitely sticky. OK, so I'm going to stretch it out sort of to fill this little oval. Now, it's an object like any other object, so it has attributes. And so I can use the show properties key to see what they are. And here you'll see it has some pretty fancy stuff. Uh, it's got some spatial properties. And it even has a table of data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, fill in the data table. I'll type some demographic data for Kerbo on me. Let's see, what we want to do is fill in my column. So now when I hit the next. OK, so the first thing maybe we'll, um, we'll enter for you guys is uh, our heights. Uh, hello. Um, Dave's about, I don't know, 75 inches tall, and I'm about, uh, oh, shall we say, uh, 50 inches tall. <laughs> and we'll get even more fanciful here because we'll do weight. 
and uh, Dave is about um, 215, going for the gold, huh, Dave? And I'm about 150. <laughs> There's my little data table, and I like to plot this data into the bar chart. That's what bar charts do, right? So let's go back to the spatial properties here and get this chart looking the way we want. So when I switched these little um, tabs or pages, uh, it plotted what it knew so far, and there it is. I don't like that. I want just this kind of um, thing. I want the bars to be side by side and a little spacing here. And oh, by the way, that one is kind of, that one color is kind of beading on the screen, so I'd like to change the weight color, say, to be black. And now when I say done, it will apply those changes to the chart, and there you are. Let me just center the sky again. I wish my mouse wasn't quite so sticky. Okay. Okay, well, we're done with this little transfer sheet. That was pretty painless, you know, as a person who had to create a chart, maybe against a deadline or something. Let's, uh, I'm going to uh, just insert one other kind of thing here. We're going to, in, using our special keyboard, we're going to insert a equation frame, which we do with the C key. And now when we inserted this equation frame, it automatically positions the caret, the type in point, inside the frame. And I can type some standard ASCII, like f of x equals. I apologize for not being able to make this um, larger. This is uh, the um, largest font I can do with this version of star. Um, and now I'd like to say maybe do a, a quotient here. So if I go to the equation frame now, I mean, if I go to the special keyboard now, the fact that the context is an equation frame gives me a different set of special characters, equation type characters. So uh, it's context sensitive. So I can say I want a fraction, and in the, the numerator, I want a summation. And you'll see that it positions the caret automatically in the lower limit of the summation. And I could type i equals 1, and then hit the next key. Now, the next key, actually, I was using the next key. I forgot to tell you about it when I was stepping through the rows and columns of the table. I was doing that with the next key. And now I'm going to use the next key to step through the parts of an equation. So when I hit the next key, it jumps to the upper limit. And I can type 100. And hit next. And it'll drop, drop, uh, jump to the right side. Now, I don't know if you can see it or not. Maybe you can see it in just a second. But I'm going to say x sub i squared. There's a couple of things I'd like to point out. First of all, can you see that the letters are in italic and the numbers are in Roman font, which is proper equation formatting, and I did not have to switch the font to get that. Also, the superscript is directly above the subscript, not offset to the right as in word processors, which again is correct equation formatting. And it's, it does that for you uh, automatically. So I'll just type some more stuff, some, some random, uh, say a product, say over J, and, uh, and we'll say it's a um, Y sub J. And now if I keep nexting, I'll eventually get to where I want to be, which is in the lower limit. For this, maybe I'll insert a uh, integral from A to B. And let's use some Greek stuff here. So I choose the Greek special character, say <laughs> rho of theta uh, and then d rho, I guess, would be the way to d theta. So I just created a mathematically typeset correct um, equation. This is very rewarding, Dave. Aren't I? Are you sure this is the last one? 
the, the last clause of that statement was going to be only using the special keyboard. I didn't even use the copy uh, of those commands this time. All I used was the special keyboard feature and the smart equation objects. All right, in the interest of time, I was, I was going to introduce, um, insert some things like fields and some other objects, which I could do into this multimedia document. Um, one thing I do want to do is get rid of the, um, the uh, fr frame border around this equation, uh, this graphics frame. So the graphics frame itself has attributes, just like the objects inside it. Its attributes have to do with its border and whether I want it centered or so forth on the page. And now I'm going to, now here's where a weakness comes in of star. I actually, to get this to look the way it will look when it's printed, I actually have to explicitly paginate it. The hardware simply wasn't able to keep up with uh, interactive pagination, sorry. But let's step back and think about what I've said here. OK. So I've created the multimedia document, properly uh, typeset and laid out in a WYSIWYG fashion. Uh, if I were to print that, this is exactly the way it'll show up. And I did it with fewer than a dozen commands, as I claimed I would do. If I wanted to print this thing, I mean to um, say, well, print it, or to mail it, what I would do is drag it to one of these uh, icons. So in fact, here is where, I guess I forgot to point out when I was talking about icons, we divided the icons into two classes, data icons and function icons. The function icons operated on the data icons. The data icons were documents, folders, record files, spreadsheets. The function icons were mailboxes, printers, file cabinets, and so forth. The way you got a function to operate was by using the move key. You selected a data icon, said move, and then clicked on a function icon. So I've just invoked the mail command by using the more generic, in general, move command. So all I have to do here is type a um, address. Say done. And it will go off and mail this thing for me. So I want to sum up here. There's a couple of lessons that I think bear thinking about. 17 years after Star came out, 1,000 times later in machine speed, memory density, and disk density, Star's interface still is simpler and um, more consistent and more usable than the systems we see today. In fact, the most pleasant experience for me in this whole thing, um, actually Dave Kerbel's had to do all the hard work of making this hardware one. All I've had to do is get familiar with Star again. And the most pleasant part of all that is um, finding out all over again how well Star um, uh, has, has survived, how, the, how well the ideas have held up in the intervening 17 years. It doesn't seem like an antiquated system. In fact, if there were any way I could use this thing, <laughs> I would. But there's nowhere I can print it. Uh, nothing I can print it on. Nowhere, nobody who can read this email. This email, by the way, that I just sent, uh, you know, I had, it had equations in it, and it had all sorts of non-ASCII stuff in it. But it doesn't matter. It just all went. Yeah. <laughs> The way, um, so Star had many fewer commands than today's system, and it didn't do it by having fewer functions. It just had fewer commands. And the way we got, we accomplished that, I hope I illustrated, was through the use of generic function keys, 
through objects that had property sheets, through virtual keyboards, and through smart objects that would do a lot of the hard work for you. We also had a taxonomy of icons, data and function icons, that led to simple ways of doing things, namely you move to a function icon and that uh, handled a whole bunch of commands there. And lastly, this notion of a copy paradigm meant that I could do quite fancy graphics if somebody had created a little graphics transfer sheet for me to use. All I had to do is then copy those things into my document. Okay, that was pretty much the demo. Um, now Dave Kerbo is going to talk about some of the um, technologies other than the, this interface. Obviously the interface has been picked up by, by all personal computer manufacturers and most workstation manufacturers. But there are a lot of other technologies in STAR that have also been picked up by other companies and Dave's going to cover